Hello and welcome everyone to Hot Topics, the Duraspace Community Webinar Series. My name is Christy Searle and I will be facilitating today's session. For your convenience, there's a chat window located at the left side of your screen. Feel free to type any questions you may have in the text box of the chat window and hit enter to send. At the end of the presentation today, we will be taking questions from our audience and we'll ask you to post your questions in the chat window at that time. We're pleased to have you with us today as we launch our 13th Hot Topic series, Vivo Plus Share, Closing the Loop on Scholarly Activity. This series is curated by Rick Johnson, who is currently the Visiting Program Officer for Share at the Association of Research Libraries. Rick is also the Program Co-Director of Digital Initiatives and Scholarship and Head of Data Curation in Digital Library Solutions for Hesburgh Libraries at the University of Notre Dame. Rick will provide us with an introduction to the series and get us started with today's webinar. Thank you all for being with us today. Great, thank you, Christy. Can everyone hear me okay? I'll take that, take that as a yes. So the so, so thank you, Christy. I'm excited to present along with Mike Conlon today about uh, this collaboration that really brings together two very complementary efforts. Uh, and in thinking about that, you know, with, with scholarship becoming more and more collaborative uh, every day, and you know, really seeing that gauging scholarly imp impact is is very difficult to do. There, there have been a lot of efforts, as you know, both at the institutional and at the community level, to try to gauge what the true impact of is of, of our researchers at various institutions, and and with that, uh, we're really looking at how. Vivo and Share together really are looking at these things from really are very complementary where one Vivo is very institutionally focused and uh, Share is very focused at the community level and by bringing these two together it really uh, will give us a true sense better of, of what is really happening out there. So, so really in the, in the first of, of three webinars here Mike and I will, will give an introduction of what is happening with this collaboration and then uh, as hopefully you've seen there will be two more webinars after this one. Uh, the second one will be Andy Ogier at uh, Virginia Tech on March 11th giving a perspective from their institution and then the third webinar will be more of a technical overview uh, from Aaron Braswell at the Center for Open Science and uh, Alexander Garcia Castro as well on March 21st. So definitely look forward uh, to those ones. So. So to get started with this webinar, uh, Mike and I, we're, we're going to give a brief history overview of the, both the Vivo and the SHARE projects, and then really look at how they complement one another, and what kind of work has there been to date. And then, of course, uh, we want to leave uh, time for questions at the end. So I will go ahead and hand it over to Mike to get started talking about Vivo. Hi. Um, so I'm Mike Conlon, and uh, as uh, you may have seen on the opening slide, uh, I'm the Vivo Project Director. Uh, I recently retired from the University of Florida as an emeritus faculty member there, uh, having spent my career in research uh, and in uh, information technology, uh, both on the uh, administrative side and on the uh, on the research side. Uh, and uh, uh, having an opportunity to work with Vivo. Um, uh, leading it through the NIH grant and now as the project director, uh, Vivo really fills a fundamental uh, gap in the knowledge of the institution. Um, we have a lot of information about a lot of things. We're really good at tracking money or books in the library or whatever it is that we've got as physical assets, uh, but we're surprisingly disarmed when it comes to understanding the actual work of the faculty, what they made and who they made it with. Um, so Vivo is, a, is a, uh, uh, a collection of different things. It's a data model, a set of ontologies. Uh, we call it the Vivo Integrated Semantic Framework. Um, and, a, and a number of related ontologies that exist in the world for representing scholars and scholarship. We work very hard to make sure that we have a um, complete uh, model um, that we can accurately represent the work of a wide variety of different um, uh, kinds of scholars um, across uh, the full breadth of, of scholar, scholarly activities. 
Um, I guess I had a little bit of an advantage there because the University of Florida is just one of those gigantic places and we seem to have one of everything. Um, so I had a fairly good firsthand experience with understanding uh, work, whether it was in agriculture or law or business or medicine or liberal arts or the humanities, fine arts, the complete range of the university. Um, we have software. Uh, it's open source, uh, free to download. Um, uh, any institution can start a Vivo project uh, today. Uh, it's community developed software, so uh, working with DuraSpace, uh, we're able to uh, uh, coordinate the activity of developers working around the world um, to make improvements to the software uh, for um, representing scholarship and then managing, displaying, and sharing the scholarly record. Um, and then we have data. So uh, we have uh, a number of sites with very significant Vivo Im implementations, uh, and just some numbers from the University of Florida um, at UF. Uh, we have about 23 million assertions uh, about the scholarly activity of about 63,000 people. Uh, we do include our research staff in our Vivo uh, because they participate in scholarship. Um, about 62,000 papers, that represents about 6,000 papers per year being produced by the university. Uh, 24,000 grants that we received over the, since about 2007, uh, and 87,000 courses taught. So a lot of a lot of activity, and then a lot of other detail. Those are just uh, the large scale metrics on the central things that people tend to think of when they think of scholarship. But we have information on mentoring and um, service to the profession, and many other things. Um, and then we have a community, somewhere around 130 sites, 24 countries. Uh, and that represents about 200,000 scholars uh, that have Vivo data uh, currently shared, um, uh, about a million uh, scholarly works. And, um, and then we have a, a fair number of Vivos that we, we don't know about, actually, because anyone can download the software and create one. So there's no registration process. So these are the numbers of the people who've come forward and said that they have Vivos uh, and have shared their data. So somewhere around 200,000 uh, scholars and a million works. Um, Vivo has been around for a while, uh, so somewhere around 2003, the original concept software for Vivo created at Cornell by John Corson Reichert. Uh, they ran it for several years at Cornell and then uh, decided to redesign it as a semantic web application uh, with ontology and a triple store and, uh, and, and these assertions that I already mentioned. Uh, in 2007, uh, people at the University of Florida met the people at Cornell uh, and started implementing Vivo at Florida. Um, I kind of served as a consultant to that effort. Uh, then in 2009, um, the NIH awarded um, a large uh, a grant to the University of Florida, Cornell, Weill Cornell, uh, Indiana University, WashU, Ponce uh, in Puerto Rico, Scripps Research Institute. Uh, and I had the privilege of leading that effort as the principal investigator. In 2010, we held our first Vivo conference at the New York Hall of Science. And since 2012, we've um, been a member supported project at DuraSpace. That's a brief history. Um, Vivo and research, well, Vivo captures uh, a complete uh, record for each scholar, so teaching, research, and service, uh, at a level sufficient to produce a CV or a biosketch. Uh, and with data that um, often doesn't appear on either of those documents. Uh, we can include in gray literature activities that do not typically create records in, in the publishing systems or in the library uh, or in the provost's office uh, regarding scholarly uh, activity in the ecosystem. And then Vivo links that data together, um, removing ambiguity from the scholarly record. So we know who did the work, we know where they did the work, we know what work they did uh, in, um, uh, in detail. Uh, and with uh, uh, with with uh, full specificity, um, these are the kinds of things that go in and out. So, uh, Vivo uh, would have uh, uh, information about the organization of your uh, institution. Uh, at Florida, that's about 950 organizations that make up the University of Florida: uh, departments, uh, academic departments, administrative departments, uh, uh, colleges, and, and such. The scholars, their publication grants they've received, the teaching they've done, the service they've done, kind of the obvious elements there. Uh, and then uh, when you have that kind of data, you're able to produce uh, profiles of the faculty, um, the kind of web pages that we see, uh, but also do ad hoc queries uh, off the data so that you can understand questions, of, get answers to questions of interest. Uh, do expert findings. Several of our Vivo sites actually 
uh, refer to their sites as uh, experts at Griffith or experts at George Washington University, uh, where the purpose of having the Vivo in a public place is for people to find the expertise the university has. Uh, we're able to do reports, create CV and biosketch, do visualizations of various kinds. Uh, and then we have a growing number of people that are using Vivo for network analysis, like social network analysis, to understand the patterns of collaborations at a university uh, and across universities. Uh, so that we can um, uh, understand um, who does work with, with who and how those collaborations change over time uh, and possibly even what kinds of interventions uh, might uh, uh, change the patterns of uh, collaboration across a university or collection of universities. Uh, here's an example of a Vivo page. This happens to be mine. And unfortunately, it's littered with a bunch of uh, administrative things because they had a lot of uh, positions, I guess, at the university. You know, but you can see the kind of standard stuff, uh, you know, the places I worked, um, the publications that I had. Uh, a, there is a, uh, access to a co-author uh, visualization, so you can see the hundreds of people that I worked with over the course of my career. Um, uh, a map of science, which uh, shows us uh, what disciplines I worked in. Uh, and a, a co-investigator network that shows us who I was co-funded with uh, on grants. Um, and the standard uh, view of Vivo could be replaced uh, uh, by, uh, by uh, IT people with something a little more creative. So here's the Vivo uh, uh, profile of a faculty member at uh, Griffith University in Brisbane, Australia. Uh, and we see that um, what they're presenting about her is significantly different than what the University of Florida is presenting about me. Um, uh, so you see her social network contacts, uh, her video. Uh, news about her and her research, uh, and then some graphic displays of, uh, of her papers, the fields that she worked in, uh, the accumulation of papers over time, uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, so Vivo can produce a very sophisticated uh, and complete scholarly record um, uh, of the work of the faculty. Uh, and with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Rick for a brief description of sure. Great, thanks, Mike. So, so SHARE is a higher education initiative to maximize research impact that was an initiative that was led by, that is led by the Association of Research Libraries and founded uh, really with support from AAU and APLU universities with a focus on maximizing research impact uh, to get an inventory of research in order to really make it widely accessible and reusable. It, it's, it's free open data set draws on currently 97 data providers. And there's also a notification service that draws on now over four and a half million events. Another important point about SHARE is that it's not just about repository data, but it is really about collecting all of these kinds of things like data management plans, preprints, uh, of course, articles and repository deposits, but also other scholarly activity that is really delving into a lot of the things that that Vivo is is involved in, and really with all the with that diverse set of data providers like funders, publishers, data repositories, IRs, etc. In addition to that, there's also a a, a very vibrant community that has uh, involvement from a wide variety of of international members, from funders to publishers to government organizations, universities, and vendors. So then looking, looking at the, the history of SHARE, uh, SHARE was really first conceived as a response to the OSTP memo that came out of the White House in February of 2013. And then in June 2013, ARL, AAU, and APLU jointly launched SHARE. And then in March of 2014, uh, ARL was awarded a joint $1 million grant from I, the IMLS and the Alfred, Alfred uh, P. P. Sloan Foundation to develop and launch Share Notify. And then really rounding out uh, the, the members joining with the Share Project, the Center for Open Science joined as Share's technical partner in 2014. Then looking at some of the milestones that have been involved with, with Share in, in April, uh, Share launched uh, the beta of Share Notify. Then in June, uh, we hit a, a huge milestone of having more than 1 million research, research, research re release events being indexed. And then looking forward into October, uh, ARL was awarded uh, a follow-up 
funding from IMLS and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for Phase 2. And now, currently, SHARE is at 97 pro providers and over 4.5 million research events. And, that, and that's something that continues to grow. And, and with that, our, the focus of SHARE has really grown beyond that original OSTP memo. So diving in a little bit about how SHARE works. So SHARE has a set of providers that it harvests from on a regular basis. And as you can see, represented from those dotted lines, squiggly lines, et cetera, things are coming into SHARE from a wide variety of ways, whether it be harvesting via OAI PMH or through Resource Sync, or even some of the institutions are pushing data directly to SHARE via the API that the Center for Open Science has developed. And then on the other side of that, uh, really any of these institutions can be consumers uh, of that data as well. So looking at some of the examples of some of the data providers, there's this, this shows a, a pretty diverse set. These are, of course, just examples with almost 100 data providers now, where we have the Department of Energy having data being harvested as well as NC State and Virginia Tech, and then Crossref is being indexed as well as a, a data source like, like Data One. There we go. And then in addition to just the, the, the backend infrastructure of Share, there's also, of course, the, the web search interface where anyone can come and search uh, records that have been indexed across these wide variety of sources. And if you look on the right side of that search box there, you'll see the little broadcast icon. And that also is something where someone can go directly to the share feed itself, in addition to how someone would interact with, with, the, uh, with the notification service. So, so how, is, is really, how is share fitting into uh, these, the, the focus of research? Share is really about capturing global events across the diverse set of sources. And, and again, it's really not just about repository data. It's, it's looking to capture that full record of scholarly activity. And in doing so, uh, simplifying how various pieces of scholarship can then be identified and linked together, then within this overall larger network that SHARE is really one piece a part of, SHARE is very active in the community talking with other aggregators, harvesters, uh, like Core and Open Air and La, La Referencia and, and REOX and lots of other groups, really to look at how can we not just look at everyone trying to harvest from every single source, but how can we really be sharing that information together. So then if we look at the, the, the original page of, of, of how data is coming in to share. When you bring Vivo into that, it's really on both sides of, of, the, of the story here, where Vivo 1 is, is a very strong uh, case as a data provider with a lot of that scholarly activity that is really not being captured in any other way. And then also, as Vivo is, is, is showing the view to at the institution level of all the different activities that scholarly, scholar, scholars are involved in, that is really not just, just an institution focus anymore. It really has to be, has to be looking at the wider community. And, and, and SHARE is a piece of that to really be able to draw on those events to tie those back to those institutional uh, events. So then really diving into the, the complementary nature of what, what SHARE is, is doing in, in Vivo, uh, share it's you know it's consuming from repositories and funders and publishers really to get that that overall picture that is then shared uh, between local and global sources and in doing so it, it's it's aimed at getting metadata across a wide variety of things so that we can really start to capture the types of scholarly activity that have emerged in addition to things like publishing. So, as, and by putting these two together, it, it really creates a, a, a really nice picture of these. So, so I'm going to hand it over to Mike to talk a little bit more about the Vivo side. 
So as Rick mentioned and we've, and we've heard, uh, Vivo is curating metadata about an organization. So uh, when we get data from various sources, whether it's from the institution or from a publisher or even from SHARE, um, we're gonna, we're, we have a very strong sense of the accuracy of that data uh, because those are our people. Uh, and so if people are saying things about our people, we wanna make sure those things are correct. And so that curation part is uh, very central to the Vivo mission. Um, we're identifying scholars in their works. And, and so by identifying, I mean, it, it, you, you may well be familiar uh, with the problem that there's, there's more than one Mike Conlon in the world. And so when we see that, you know, when we ask for queries like find the papers by Mike Conlon, uh, we have to identify the scholar uh, more carefully than we could do with their name. Uh, and so that's, a, that's ongoing work in the ecosystem of today. Uh, and we hope that that will, uh, there are a number of efforts going on to improve that in the future. Uh, but Vivo currently spends, uh, you know, there is effort in identifying the scholars and their works. Um, we, and as I've mentioned previously, we have a deep metadata model for teaching research and service, uh, trying to represent all the activities of individual scholars, uh, regardless of their status or the point in their career or their, or their discipline, um, with a focus on the scholar and the scholar's work in the organization of the material as profiles, as we saw. Uh, and we're able to express details not otherwise expressed in the ecosystem and possibly not even known uh, in the ecosystem. Um, uh, and then we do uh, share our data globally. Uh, the numbers I gave were for uh, uh, Vivo data that has been uh, shared. Um, uh, and so uh, we, uh, it, it, Vivo provides natural mechanisms for sharing that data quite, quite, uh, uh, quite easily. Um, we're going to move on to talking about how Share and Vivo uh, are working together, have worked together. Uh, and in particular, we're going to talk about three uh, pieces of work. Um, the Share Harvester for Vivo, uh, Share to Vivo, uh, and, a, and an emerging project called Share Link, uh, which will involve Vivo and Share and Fedora. Um, Share Harvester for Vivo uh, is, a, uh, is, a, is an application that um, allows Vivo data uh, to be uh, made available to share. Uh, so it's as simple as that. So in, in Rick's previous diagram, it's the left side of the diagram where Vivo would pre be providing data, uh, research events as they call them, uh, to uh, share notify uh, for use in things like share search. Uh, and so Vivo becomes a source of data uh, for share. Uh, and so to do that, you know, Vivo site uh, contact share says that they would like to make their data available. Uh, and then uh, the Vivo API uh, is a technical capability built into Vivo that uh, allows uh, the data to be shared. Uh, and uh, the site would make uh, credentials for their Vivo API available to share. Uh, and then Share uses the Share Harvester, which was developed uh, uh, jointly uh, by Share and Vivo, uh, to harvest data from the Share site, from the Vivo site, and make it available in Share. Uh, and by this mechanism, the share users benefit from access to Vivo's detailed data regarding the scholarship of the Vivo site. Uh, and then a Vivo, so it's, it's pretty simple to do. The Vivo site just offers data to share uh, by supplying a URL and access credentials for the, for the Vivo API. Uh, and there are plenty of people at share who would be happy to help you with that. Um, so that's Share Harvester. It's, it's, uh, it's actually pretty straightforward. If you have a Vivo, um, Share Harvester can uh, uh, make data from your Vivo available to the to the people using Share worldwide. Um, Share to Vivo goes the other way. Share to Vivo uh, takes records from Share and makes them available to your Vivo. So it's quite possible that Share has information about your uh, your scholars and their works uh, that uh, that you would like to have represented in your Vivo. Uh, and so Share to Vivo is an open source utility for providing data from Share to your Vivo site. Uh, the Vivo site uh, basically uses Share to Vivo to issue a query to Share for metadata regarding the scholarship of people at their organization. And then Share to Vivo can then populate Vivo with the returned metadata. Um, and then, of course, Vivo sites benefit from the extensive records available from Share. So uh, that's, uh, that's also uh, a tool that's uh, freely available uh, and, and ready to be used. So let's share it to Vivo. Uh, turn it back to Rick and talk about share link. Yes, thanks, Mike. So, so share link is something that is still in the early planning stages. And 
and it, and it, and it originated from uh, thinking about how one could really harness uh, data from SHARE at the institutional level. You know, that, that really being drawing connections between researchers, collaborators, items in repositories, related research activities, related works, et cetera. And, you know, when, when thinking about bringing all of those together, it really, it, it, that we, we really landed on looking at bringing Fedora with its intellectual, intellectual work focused linked data platform, that, that being Fedora 4, uh, Bevo with its person focused scholarly activity linked data, and then share with its index of global research life cycle, life cycle events. Bringing all those two together allows us to, to create a unified graph of repository items, researchers, events, et cetera, which then brings us down to the, to the use cases we're looking at. So, so by having that unified graph, being able to recommend related items when, when viewing a repository item or looking at a researcher's profile uh, and, or, or browse those items and, and have those come in from similar disciplines or similar venues, similar venues being uh, the same art journal publication from the, uh, another presentation at the same conference, et cetera, and, and also looking at you know, just links between other researchers that are doing similar kinds of work. And then in addition to that, in addition to having that draw off of the, the, that virtual browse, so to speak, really having combined researcher department views with share events and repository items in, in one dashboard is what's conceived. To have one place that can really unite all of those together. And, th and then finally, our third use case is looking at how could we expand the kinds of items that appear in search results. So, so by, by thinking about the second and third level items, it's starting to include items in the search results that were not actually hits in the search results, but are linked to other records that were hits. So, so if you, I, I, I think of it analogous to how someone would approach their network in LinkedIn, if you're familiar with that, where you have second and third level connections between your various colleagues and really looking at exploring scholarship in a, in a similar manner. And there's also a note there about how there's really a lot of alignment with what we're talking about here with the linked data for libraries project that, that is heading into its, its next phase, where they have been also looking at how can, how can libraries better harness linked data within library catalogs, linking records together, and there's a lot of the, the thinking and the work here that overlaps with a lot of their thinking and really exploring uh, opportunities to share models, uh, reuse data. There, there's a lot of synergies just within the, the various communities as well. So, so there's a lot of uh, potential there. And this is something that we haven't begun development on, but, but development uh, to start prototyping this is uh, scheduled for the spring. So I'm going to hand it back over to Mike to talk more about some of the current things that are going on in the system. So as we move with this kind of work and, uh, and, and any ideas you might have about uh, share a link, you know, please send them, send them in. That would be great. We'd, we'd love to hear from everyone about how we might make things better. Um, in doing this work, we, we find a number of um, issues recurring. Um, one is that, as I mentioned previously, scholars are not uniquely identified. Uh, and so uh, disambiguation um, is, is the catch-all term uh, for trying to identify works that, uh, that uh, in, in which you have a situation in which the publisher or the source that you're getting from the, the data from um, actually only recorded the scholar's name. Um, or might, it might, record a, might record an ID for the scholar that you don't have associated with the scholar. So you know, they may tell you that, that this scholar's internal ID number is X. That doesn't really help you because you don't, you don't know scholar's internal ID number X. Uh, and so trying to figure out um, you know, when, when scholars have common names, uh, this can become a significant problem. Um, there, are, there are six 
um, J. Johnson's at the University of Florida. Um, and so trying to figure out which of these papers belong to which of the scholars uh, can be uh, uh, an issue. Um, uh, we, uh, we know about ORCID, of course, and we work closely with ORCID. Uh, and that is a way to identify scholars, and we're big fans, um, but, and it's growing, uh, but it's not pervasive. Uh, and so the number of scholars that actually have ORCIDs and for whom their uh, works could be identified by their ORCID is uh, currently vanishingly small, uh, but per per perhaps growing um, each year. Um, so scholars not uniquely identified. Um, uh, it turns out the works may not be uniquely identified. So uh, it's, it's good when works have DOI, uh, and many of the published works do. Uh, but if you're putting together a scholarly record for someone who's been around for a while, uh, they may have works that uh, that predate the pervasive nature of DOI. Uh, they may the gray literature may not have DOI. Uh, you may not have a uh, uh, a scholarly practice in which people are uh, putting their uh, gray literature in places where a DOI could be obtained. Um, uh, and so, uh, and, and, and they may have other, so they may be creating data sets, but they not, may not be getting DOI for those data sets. They may be creating presentations, but not getting DOI for them. They may be uh, creating software, but not getting DOI for their software. All of those are solvable cases, but they involve change of practice for the faculty. And if, if you've worked with faculty, you know that that's an issue in the ecosystem. Um, so it, uh, the, 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 the published peer-reviewed uh, current uh, journal articles mostly have DOI. Well, there's the issue of third world literature and some of that doesn't have uh, DOI either. So, so there's an issue in identifying the works. Um, and it turns out that the same work appears in a corpus many, 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 many times um, because they, they may not be de-identified uh, uh, depending on how the contributions work and how the system works. You may have the same particular piece of work counted many, many times. Um, uh, the, median, the median number of authors on a paper at the University of Florida is currently seven. Uh, and so you could have seven different faculty members reporting the same work. Um, and, and, and of course, we don't, we, don't, uh, we, don't, we don't want to talk about means because the physics people you know, have, that, have those papers with 2,000 authors on them. So that's a, that's a different kind of issue. Um, and then the organizations themselves may not be uniquely identified. So um, <laughs> uh, we don't, we, the, the world of scholarship currently does not um, have a good practice around identifying organizations. We tend to think that our names are good enough. Um, the University of Florida, you ought to know what that is and where it is. And, you know, we're very proud of it, but, um, but people confuse it. Uh, and people confuse lots of other organizations. Uh, and uh, and so to say that a work was done by this person at that organization um, comes with a lot of uh, potential miscommunication. Um, so the publications may not be associated with individuals or organizations. Um, best example of that is books. Uh, when faculty members publish books, they often uh, uh, have a contract with the publisher. And they don't disclose where they work. The publisher didn't ask. It's not in the book. Uh, and so uh, find, associating uh, 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 organizations with books, with works, with, uh, sorry, um, associating people with works, with organizations uh, requires uh, some uh, sleuthing uh, in the current state of affairs. Um, we do have uh, a, a grid, uh, which is a new service uh, from digital science, making data available, freely available without, with a CC by license. Um, uh, uh, regarding uh, organizations uh, involved in research around the world. Uh, they have a very well curated database of about 55,000 organizations, uh, really a nice resource uh, uh, and good of them to make it uh, freely available by CC BY. Um, uh, Rick, you want to? Sorry about the delay there. Uh, my machine just froze on 
and letting me unmute for a second there. So, okay, so, so talking about other issues in the ecosystem with share drawing from a wide variety of sources, there really is a pretty big divergence in how the data is structured as well as, as the kinds of fields that are being uh, sent to share. And with, with that, as share is bringing all these various data sources together and it's all of those are there's still this some gap between hey rick uh, i'm sorry to interrupt you it sounds like can you hear me rick okay. rick sorry folks it sounds like rick's connection got bad we may have just lost him Or he is still talking and he thinks we can hear him. I'm not sure which it is, so just give us a second here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so at this time, work, um, Rick is working on his issues. This is a good time to take a big stretch. We are in the home stretch of today's presentation. Um, if we can't get Rick back on the line, Mike, are you up next? Well, or... um, we, uh, I, we basically finished the, uh, you know, the presentation part and we were moving into discussion at this time. Okay. So Rick, I'm not sure if you can hear me. If you can, what I'm going to ask you to do is log out of the meeting and why don't you try logging back in. And absolutely, let's go back to this slide. Um, this is what Rick was talking about when he got interrupted. And at this time, we do have some questions in the chat window. I'm going to give Rick another minute or two. He's going to log back in. But for those of you who do have any questions or comments, go ahead and add them to the chat window so that we can be sure to answer them. Mike, while we wait for Rick, are there any questions that we currently have in the chat window that you would like to start answering for our audience? Oh, let me take a look. Uh, so there's a question uh, about orchids, but it looks like there's a discussion about how but it's going back and forth. Does Vivo use ORCID to identify authors? Vivo can use ORCID to identify authors. So uh, as the responder noted, Vivo has a place to record ORCIDs. It also has a, uh, a mechanism to verify the ORCID. So the, the logged in Vivo user can say, this is my ORCID and demonstrate it by logging into ORCID. 
so that you have sort of an official match between uh, the ORCID profile and the VIVO uh, profile. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, that is uh, possible uh, with the ORCID uh, identifier. Uh, and then there's a, a comment that um, matching uh, Vivo people uh, uh, with people in share and vice versa uh, could be difficult without a common identifier. I think that's exactly right. Um, you typically need several pieces of information to determine that you have the right person. Uh, and, uh, uh, and so you're, you're looking for every piece of information that share can give you about who that person might be. Uh, that's associated with the work. Um, and so sometimes there is, uh, depending on the source of information in SHARE, because they have such a wide variety of different sources, um, the, uh, the author uh, in SHARE might be coming to you with uh, uh, an email address. That would be good. Then you might be able to match that directly. Uh, or uh, or, or uh, uh, some kind of simple uh, uh, indication of the uh, of the organization of the of the author. Um, so there's a there's a, a common identifier this would be a good thing. Uh, uh, the guest asks, is there any duplication of effort between Vivo and Orchid? Um, I actually think very little because Orchid is assembling data that's in the environment typically uh, from publishers. That's the most straightforward part of, of what goes into a Vivo profile. If you think of a CV, um, the, the you know, peer-reviewed journal articles are one element of a profile. Um, uh, we can harvest that data from ORCID, so if they've done all of that, uh, there's no effort involved at the Vivo side. We can just import that, uh, and that's one part of what you would see in a, in a Vivo profile. Uh, when you saw my profile with all of that organizational information, that was coming from the university's HR system. So that wouldn't be available to ORCID and did not involve me as a faculty member. I didn't type any of that in. So there's no real duplication of effort there. If, if I provided all of that, as a faculty member, if I provided all of that to ORCID, it would be a tremendous amount of work So for me personally. So we, don't, we, we tend to automate that in vivo, uh, and it tends not to be available uh, in the ORCID world. Um, an opportunity for Vivo and Orchid to do something similar as described with Share. Um, we do have both Orchid to Vivo. We do have both push and pull um, services uh, from Orchid to Vivo. Uh, uh, that wasn't the purpose of this talk, but um, there are such things. So, uh, if you want to get data from Orchid into your Vivo, you can. If you want to get data from your Vivo into Orchid, you can. Okay. And then this question from McMaster is about share. There's a question about, is this sharing between Share and Vivo happening now, or is this planned with an instance of Vivo? Um, the University of Florida uh, was sharing its data through a development instance with Share. Uh, our security people wanted to review that practice. Uh, they're not going to find anything, and then they will allow us to do it on the production instance. Uh, so uh, it, it, uh, it'll be in production shortly. Any other site could... Uh, could go at that uh, right now. The, the software is available. Thanks, Mike. I, I am communicating with uh, Rick via email just to let you guys know. It seems like his network has frozen up, so I'm trying to get him on a phone line here.
Okay, folks, are there any other questions um, that Mike can answer while we have him and while we keep our fingers crossed for Rick to make a connection? I'm just going to take a minute to let you know of the next webinar that is going to be happening on March 11th. We will be presenting institutional perspectives on the impact of SHARE and Vivo together. We certainly hope that you can join us for that. We'll be sending out a reminder the day of the webinar so that you all have the correct link. And I also want to post up here the contacts to learn more about SHARE or Vivo or to communicate directly with Rick or Mike. We have their information listed. And Christy, I think I'm on, back on now. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Welcome back, Rick. We missed you. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry for so, the issues we appear to be having with our network here at Notre Dame at the moment. It's all right. We understand that happens. And what we have done in your absence is we left up this slide so people could review the information you were speaking of before we lost you. And then Mike started taking questions from our audience through the chat window. One of the questions that um, he left to you, it's a share question, is from McMaster University and I can start with that question or I wanted to give you the opportunity to make any final comments that you didn't get to make. Oh sure, so so I, I am actually able to pull up the slide again so we'll, hopefully this will last. Uh, so in terms of the issues in the ecosystem, one of the things that I, that I didn't get a chance to talk about yet was with, with all of the divergence between uh, data sources that are coming in to share. One of the important efforts we have that is just launching from share is is something that we'll be using a the a do curation toolkit that that's been developed for share that is aimed at directly enhancing metadata that is in share coming into share, et cetera. And one of the community efforts that is paired alongside that is a new uh, program for curation associates and those that are at libraries have probably received some communication about that over the past few days that is looking to, to, to create some ambassadors as, as associates for, for SHARE that, that will both do training and outreach within the community uh, as well as really look at how can they actively enhance and enrich metadata that, that is in SHARE and how it is coming from their own local sources as well. Okay, thanks, Rick. And that was, sure. So I'm going to take us back to a question that was asked earlier. And Rick, this is a question for you. How does SHARE handle work duplication as Mike had described in his part of the presentation? So for example, how does it recog reconcile published versions, say coming from cross-ref met metadata, with pre or post prints sitting in an institutional repository? Is there some sort of software-driven FRBRization going on? Yeah, so there, that is something that is currently an area that's being worked on pretty actively where there, there, there are likely duplicate records in share at the moment where, you know, because of a lot of the same issues that uh, Vivo is facing in terms of records not having, not all records having DOIs, uh, ORCID IDs assigned to researchers, et cetera, uh, those are the, some of the same issues that share is facing on, on, a, on a, in some cases, a wider scale and a similar scale uh, where a lot of those records coming in, if, if they do not have those items attached, then the best that can be done is, is, is the deduping that, that is pretty standard in terms of records based on titles, et cetera. But to, to really be, uh, have a higher level of confidence with those, we have been working pretty closely with uh, groups like Crossref and DataCite to get their data pulled in and then have that be cross-referenced with all the data that is already in SHARE. And we're also working preactively with, with ORCID as well to get more 
more of the ORCID type data attached to things. But of course, as, as Mike said, uh, that's, that's pretty much as good as uh, the ORCIDs that are actually linked to researchers, which is the numbers are growing, uh, but we're not, we're not, there, there is still is some, some ground to cover there. And those are also a lot of things that the, we're really looking for those curation associates, associates to really be focused on as well. And do you have a best practice on how to implement the use of Vivo plus share at an institution to present an action plan to those that are in charge? So Mike, did you want to take, take a crack at that one first? Sure. Well, we're going to hear two uh, more talks about that, actually. Andy will be talking about the use of share of Virginia Tech, and then uh, Alex will be talking about uh, uh, how the software actually works. Um, but I guess the, the interesting thing in there was to, to, about the people in charge. Um, and so uh, we, we don't have such a thing, but I think it's a great idea. And, uh, and I think by the time we get to the third webinar, we should have such a thing. So let's go in that direction. Yes, indeed. And, and as, as uh, Mike shared with me earlier, they're, they're very close to launching it at the University of Florida. There's, there's basically an, uh, there's reviews, uh, institutional reviews that are happening from a security perspective of data being, that would be released uh, to share from their local Vivo, which, which I, I think both, both Mike and I are, are pretty confident that that is not going to be a roadblock in the end since as Mike shared, there's already data being shared in the wider Bebo network as well. That's also another open access network that that the University of Florida's Bebo is is going into. So, so as we roll into these next couple webinars, uh, the information about how to actually take this and implement this at your own Bebo institution, or if you're not even using Bebo yet, you know, exploring how. You know, this may be the catalyst to getting started with Vivo and, and Share. Uh, the, there's the third webinar will go into a lot of the details about how to actually get started with that. Thank you both. And through the chat window, we've had a, a couple side conversations going on. Um, one of our guests asked about, are small universities using Vivo or is it used more by large research universities? And, and Mike responded that Vivo has quite a mix of institutions, mainly large research universities, research organizations, organizations and international universities. And Mike posted the link to Vivo's registry. And this gives you a little bit more information about organizations Vivo and you can find out who is using the software. One question here we have is a, a follow-up. Um, I need to be able to understand how to implement this, to be able to present to the leadership team who will make the final decisions. It sounds like you will address those steps later. And I think that's absolutely right. In our upcoming webinars, we hear from the folks who have adapted the share and, and made that share in vivo connection. And sometimes our, our best way to learn is from the mistakes or steps that others in similar situations have taken. So I hope that the second and third webinars you guys will join us for to, to learn more about that. And I'm not sure if Mike or Rick would like to add anything to that. I think that's fine. I think we'll, we will have um, a, a document. I know people like documents, so we'll, we'll, we will have a document. Um, <laughs> On, on some thoughts about this. Best practices are tough because institutions are different. So, you know, there will be, uh, there will be some disclaimers in there, but uh, we'll, we'll uh, provide you with our best, uh, best shot at, uh, at how these things fit together in an actual organizational setting. Yeah, and, and to add on to that, of, of course, as, as this, this type of uh, integration collaboration is, is really being uh, finalized right now with the University of Florida that all of the code is done, but it, it hasn't, it, 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 there will be the first institution to implement that as, as it's brought into other institutions. Then that next step is really to look at 
are there any things that were uh, something new that's a little bit different about a very different institution? And as that uh, implementation base grows, uh, more and more that documentation will, of course, mature. And, and all of those, those minor tweaks that might be necessary will, will kind of roll through the process. Uh, this is... Thank you, Rick. Mike, can you talk a little bit how Vivo works in a consortium of institutions? Would each entity have their own instance of Vivo, or would they just use one? So uh, at the current time, we're working with two large consortia, and they are both interested in having Vivo at each of their institutions. Um, so we're working with the Southeast uh, University Research Association, that's 62 universities in the United States. And then we're also working with the Clinical and Translational Science Awardees, and that's another 65 uh, universities uh, uh, that, are, uh, that have these major NIH grants. Uh, both of those uh, groups are moving to implement Vivo uh, through their consortia at the institutional level. Um, uh, we are in conversation with a, a number of other groups about the second model, about hosting a, uh, a, uh, a single Vivo uh, that consortia members could use. Um, that would be a, quite a different service, um, uh, in part because the consortia members would have to fully agree about how to represent their scholars. Uh, and uh, uh, we're pretty happy with the idea that um, the institutions have a lot of local control over their vivos and can decide uh, what needs to be, uh, where they need to go into great detail and where they, uh, where they don't. Um, and so uh, the, the, the single hosted model consortium thing is interesting, but not, not something that we currently have in place. And then the consortia pool their data. So we have, uh, 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 we, ha we have, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, a number of institutions uh, uh, sharing their data with each other uh, in great detail. Um, and that, uh, that provides a very rich uh, uh, view of the interconnections between the scholars at those organizations. Thank you, Mike. And Christy, I'm just scrolling through the list of questions here, and I and I and I want to see if I could follow up quickly on the question that Judy Rudenberg, who's also on the webinar, thankfully answered answered a little bit for me while I was trying to get reconnected about uh, whether uh, Share has its own ontology that then integrates in with uh, Vivo, and a lot of that. So what what exists now is a lot of the the mapping that's happening with that share to Vivo uh, source code that, that Alexander Garcia Castro created, uh, then the a lot of what we expect to do that Julie is really, really alluding to will, will come about as we're as we're building up the share link application that, that is going to be looking closely at how best to unify uh, information from those three different kinds of, of sources. And we're looking very closely at uh, the ontologies that are already in play within Vivo that are pretty mature, as well as the patterns that are being developed uh, within the linked data platform in Fedora 4. And, and really within that, really looking to standards as opposed to trying to always develop something that, that is new, a new snowflake, so to speak. Thanks, Rick. At this time, we are at 2 o'clock to be respectful of everybody's time. I would like to thank you all for being with us today. Uh, we did have one final question that Mike has answered in the chat window. Anything, any final thoughts, Mike or Rick, that you would like to share? Uh, no, I just... I don't think I, so other than... Yeah. Go ahead. Just that I think yeah, we're in this together. together. In, in trying to improve the scholarly ecosystem. So these, these issues that were raised today are issues that we're all involved with, and I, and I hope each of the people on the call can help contribute in their own way. Yeah, and, and add, on, add on to that, it really is, it's not just this is going to happen in the community and this is going to happen at the, in, at the institution level. It has to be the various sides working together, like it's happening with share connecting to Vivo like is happening with the curation of the associates program that we're talking about. 
uh, for SHARE and, and all of the other different efforts that are happening. If they're, the best is that folks just keep talking and figure out how best to work together. And we definitely hope that you join us for the follow-up webinars in, in a few weeks. All right. On behalf of DuraSpace, thank you very much, Rick, for not only curating this series, but also for presenting with us today. And Mike, always a pleasure to have you, and thank you very much for the information that you shared. We thank all of you for being here. This concludes today's session. Please enjoy the rest of your day.